The next stage is the design. As we like to say on Saburo, the style, because our customers cut style. And here is the style that we're going to make our jacket in. Now, for the very, very first time, exclusively to you and all who are doing the mastered course, I'm going to allow you to use my signature style here, based with a, a 24 karat gold stripe on a Super 150s cloth. What is actually different about this style is the lapel details, the pocket details, and the handcraft tailoring, which I will point out to you now. The outside chest pocket is cut in harmony with the shoulder line. The lapel, the width at the top, with a real flower hole, with a loop at the back to accommodate the stem of a flower, should your customer wish to wear a flower. Follows down to the button one styling, well balanced when it's unbuttoned, stays together, and then follows through to the side pocket detail, which the pocket line begins below the waistline. So when the pockets at the sides are occupied, it builds the hip up. When the inside pockets are occupied, it builds the chest up, it does not interfere with the waistline. So what we're trying to do is create the optical illusion, if you like, of a small waist. So we do not bulk the waistline. Follows through to the side here, real buttonholes on the cuffs. Functional. They can all be unbuttoned. You can see here they're all real. We'll be making five button cuffs for our pure cashmere chalk stripe suit. The inside of the garment, you see, a touch of fun, expressing a bit of personality here with the fancy lining, but the lining actually coordinates with the blue on the suit. Two inside pockets. What we'll be doing in addition is giving you a ticket pocket on the left facing for business cards or mobile phone and so on. What you'll also observe is the hand stitches on the edge. We've done that on the seams. We've done it all the way through, also on the side, under, under the arm, the front, and importantly, at the back of the sleeves. So we have style at the front of the garment and also at the back, because if I swivel this garment around, you will see that we've got two vents and the hand stitch follows through on the side and at the center back seam here. Observe also that the distance apart on the stripe on the seam is the same. So we do not disturb the stripe there coming into the waist and we finish with a complete stripe. And that is the style we'll be working on. So you'll see the transformation from that flat piece of cloth into something that looks very, very close to, to this garment here. I noticed the uh, flower hole in the lapel is different to the one on the cuffs. Um, is there any reason for that? Well, I, I discussed earlier on style. The difference between style and fashion is that style would last a lot longer than fashion. Fashion is to discredit what you have so you can go out and buy something new. But uh, here, the flower hole is, uh, is practical as well, but it picks up the theme on the stripe. This is a gold stripe, so I've made the flower hole gold. But it also picks up the theme of the lining here, so it coordinates. And uh, adds a touch of interest. No one wears a flower anymore on their lapel. And, but I still create a feature. For instance, the one I'm wearing is multicolored. The buttonhole itself, or the flower hole if you like, looks like a flower, but it is actually a practical buttonhole. I noticed that the, uh, the, the ticket and the, the flap are slightly different to your, to your usual uh, pockets. What's the reason behind well, that? Well, the usual pockets that you'll find with most other, other tailors, they're parallel. Here, I've created a, a, a feature here with the straight pocket that runs along the same line here, and the flap runs along the same line as the bottom, the shape runs along the same line as the fronts. Now here, but the pocket is angled, which runs along the line of the shoulders. So I'm mirroring the image of the shoulder lines and creating something that's subtly different from every other garment, so that it stands out in an interesting way, as opposed to being garish. I see the, the, the style is uh, slightly different to your normal suit. How did you uh, get to come to, to develop this? To where it is well, now? what you might say is a normal suit is what every other tailor does. What I do is different. I first developed this style a very, very long time ago, actually. It's around about 1977, when I entered a competition as a, a very, very young tailor competing against all the tailors in the land at the Merchant Tailors Competition. I wanted to produce a suit that was different to everyone else's. And I wondered, how can I make it different? Because these are really fine tailors that's been doing tailoring a lot longer than I have been. And so I decided to to take the conventional style and personalize it 
in a way that would make it outstanding in a very, very subtle way. And I did it with the outside chest pocket. I did it with the, the effect of the flaps. I changed the parallel lines, which everyone else does, and so that I'll make it interesting so that it'll be observed, it'll be commented on. I started using a different color flower hole and lapel, and then I extended it to the front and to the, to the sleeves, but that's been copied quite a lot. And so what I decided to do more recently is to get a, a thread colored exclusively for myself so I can make a flower hole like I'm wearing that's actually very different. And so this is how I distinguish my style. I continue to innovative ways of making our style distinctive. And here I'm sharing with you all of the subtle changes I've made by transforming the conventional suit into something that's very, very personal. The next stage is to take you through the entire process of how to handcraft a garment that's going to look very much like this one. The finer points and the detail of, of high quality tailoring is very, very important to us. If you look at this, for instance, how we've matched the collar and the lapel, the peak, delta shape, our signature style, the pocket details are straight, flap angled, pocket angled, flap straight and rounded to mirror the image of the front here. Cable stripe, cloth in pure cashmere, here, real buttonholes, functional, that can be undone. But if you tilt this jacket around, you will see all our lines are matching, both vertical and horizontal. On the sleeves, you can see them coming together. At the side seam, you can see them all coming together to match up. In addition to all of that, we've got the top stitch. You can see little details of the hand stitches with the seam slightly raised. So we've made a feature of the raised seam all the way through the side, sleeve, at the center back, you can see the top stitches. And we've got a complete stripe at the broadest part of the back. And we mirror that with a complete stripe at the bottom, the hem here. So there's continuity in the styling. Gives that V effect at the back. And if you tilt it round to the front, again, we follow it through with a the theme of a real flower hole with a loop at the back to accommodate the stem. To add to the fun in having your own personally tailored garment is that you have a fancy lining. It's all an important part of expressing, expressing your individuality. Today, I'd like to speak about buttons. How, where, and why. How is how the buttons are sewn on, of course, where the buttons are positioned, and why they're positioned where they are. For instance, we have a single button sport jacket here. And the buttons that we saw on at the front is strategically placed on the waist. And it's placed on the natural waist. The natural waist is actually the, exactly the same position as the elbow. So you'll find the elbow line and the button on the waist is in the perfect position. And that gives you a much better balance to enhance the figure, to give the illusion on occasions of a smaller waist. And of course, in planning, when you lay your patterns on a, on a Czech sports jacket, for instance, in planning the position of your buttons. This start in particular is very symmetrical design, but here I've introduced the outside ticket pocket on the left side as well as on the right side. And that is to make it, not only make it a little bit different, but make it interesting. What we've done here, instead of having the button position on the middle of the check, what we've got is two pink checks below the button position, and two pink checks above the button position. So the idea is to create balance. Also, we have the right neck on the button, and the neck on the button is so that when the button is functional, it's buttoned up, you do not gape at the buttonhole. Also, we have under the lapel and under the collar, we've got buttons. On a cold day, for, for instance, you can actually draw in your lapel and button up like this and on the collar we can do the same. Inside we've got or under the collar we've got this beautiful multicolored cross stitches which on occasions will be seen 
on a, on a cold day, for instance, you can see there are buttons under the color. We've got a pink one here. We've got a different color button here to coordinate with the overall colors. And we have buttons on the cuff. All functional and different colors here to show. But the important thing is the neck on the button. The button has to be sewn with the neck to give it durability to ensure that the buttonholes remain closed and only the keyhole or the eye of the buttonhole is occupied as well as the durability is the strength in the button. As long as there is sway, then the button is actually sewn on stronger. So as we button this back up, you can see the thickness of where the button is sewn, you can actually see the buttonholes remain closed. Now, let me show you how I attached the button. So what we will be doing here is actually sewing a button with a shank. The thickness that we have here, we'll start with approximately quarter of an inch or five millimeters. By the time we finished, it will actually be reduced to just about one eighth of an inch. In preparation to sew on a button, you need a thread. You need a very strong thread, but if you don't have a strong thread, I would suggest you use just uh, the Coats machine thread. Now, the Coats machine thread is quite strong. You need approximately six inches to sew on the button. So I'm um, at four cords, four layers. So what I shall be doing here is measuring about 18 inches uh, four times, so it's 72 inches. So that's doubled tripled, quadruple, just to be sure that I've got enough thread. The stronger thread is usually a, a nylon thread, but I'm avoiding using a nylon thread. In this instance, I'm using a cotton, because most of you, I think, would have a cotton thread for your machine. So double layer. You would need, of course, a needle with a, a large enough eye so that when you thread the needle, you won't have a, an issue of struggling. Here you can see we've got two layers of cotton threading the needle. So you're getting, you need thread, of course, you need needle, and you need wax, beeswax. So you thread the needle two layers, and so when you pull those two layers together, you'll end up with what we call four cord. No more than four cord because it's going to be much too thick. So you can sew the button several times. And here I've got a beeswax, which you can get at any tailoring trimming suppliers. Just wax that properly for about three or four times. Make sure there's enough wax to actually bond the bits of thread that come together. You see that's well bonded. But to give it even more strength, we actually curl the thread. So if you just stick the needle down like that, and you curl the thread on one side, if we just curl that, you can just hold on to the needle on one hand. And incidentally, if you're making a buttonhole and you don't have gimp, you do use something similar, but instead of four cords, I'll have six cords because I need to keep it a little bit thicker. So this is how you make a gimp as well. You curl it. You curl it as much as you possibly can and then give it a nice press. Place the iron on it and the iron is, is hot and then just simply pulling the thread through. Having done it once, twice, perhaps a third time, just to make sure that that wax is really properly melted. So here you can see, I've left the wax on this pad here, and you can see quite clearly how and where the wax have actually stained the cloth. 
Now that's okay with this pad, so that's, that's not a problem. Now some tailors actually wipe the wax away, and I don't think that's enough. It needs to be pressed. You can see how the cloth is stained here. You don't want that to happen on, on your jacket. This is a tweed, it won't show that much, but in most cloths, plain cloths, it would actually show. Now I'm going to sew the button on. I've already marked the button position. We got our button here. Now this is this is a button with four holes. Most buttons they've got four holes. You've got only one supplied as a two-hole horn button. We've got four holes. And usually it's my thing that I've got a check jacket, multicolored check. I'm going to sew the buttons with a cross. Most times I actually sew with a parallel line because some customers, depending on their religion, believe it or not, they don't like a cross on their button. They prefer parallel lines on the button. So I would recommend you sew your buttons on parallel as a standard. And for exceptional cases, you sew with a cross. First of all, I don't usually put a, a knot in the thread but I hide the ends in between the layers. So you can't see anything on this side or there, but in between the thread will be hidden. And just to create a foundation, I just sew through once, so I've got that foundation. Tuck the needle into the hole and onto the opposite side like this. Here the distance apart that you've got the holes is the distance apart you're actually going to be sticking the needle through. And I prefer to sew all the way through because in the middle of the facing and outside I've got a layer of body canvas and I want to have a very strong button. You know I said before strength and sway are important. So the sway is the movement of the shank and here the strength is that sticking the needle in the same width, but as we stick that needle in, I'm actually going to be sticking it on an angle. And the reason for an angle is that I want to show less of the thread on the inside. If you have your fingers like this and you just gauge, you, you could see that's about five millimeters, and that's the shank, or a quarter of an inch, that's the shank I'm going to use. So we've got that looseness. And of course, when I stick the needle in the second time round, here I'm just going to go about a millimeter away, but then tucking the needle on an angle. And if you see, even though I'm just about a millimeter or less than an eighth of an inch, about a sixteenth of an inch away from when I pull the needle, here at the inside, I'm actually quite a, a long distance away from the previous where I've tucked the needle in previously. So I've tucked the needle in on an angle and getting on to the other hole. And now I'll place my index finger underneath to maintain the shank and go right across and do the same thing again. So now you can see here I've got a cross where I'm actually sewing. If you look here you'll see a, a cross where the first stitch and then the second stitch you've got four separate layers there. And now I'm pulling there. And this is where the shank starts at just about a quarter of an inch. When it's finished, it's actually going to be reduced. And I'll show you how, how that happens. So again, I keep my finger on underneath. And again, I go with just a, a sixteenth of an inch away and on an angle onto the first hole. So now we're crossing over onto the first hole. And onto the second hole again on an angle. So you can see you can see clearly where the needle comes from one direction and goes to the opposite direction. And of course, just remember to keep your fingers in to maintain the shank. Because we want to keep all layers of thread at the same length. Same again, another eighth of an inch or a sixteenth onto the third hole that we used. And if you prepare well uh, your thread, all you need to do is go through two twice on each hole. So here I am, I've gone all the way through twice on each hole. Now the third stitch, so we count those as two stitches, is actually from the opposite direction 
back on but not into the buttonhole and you just hold on to the button there try and ideally have the cross in the same direction as the checks on your jacket and you curl around and curl around I'm actually pulling this really really tightly and that is what actually reduces the uh, height of the shank now we'll find and then you tuck the needle all the way through you would find that extra that, that width of shank that you've got I mean this button's got a lot of sway that width of shank that you've got actually would be enough to accommodate the thickness of the buttonhole side and when the button is buttoned you won't get the buttonhole gaping now that we've done that in an effort to not to have too much of the thread showing again approximately a sixteenth of an inch you go away from where you started sewing so you've got the end of the thread hidden away in between and you can just give yourself a second chance to ensure that that thread doesn't pull out so I avoid using knots but what I want is neatness on both inside and outside I need strength and I need a certain amount of sway as long as this button can move it'll stay there stronger now just to finish off I can button button the jacket you can see when this button is done up the, the buttonhole is not gaping it actually stays closed you've got a shank accommodated with the keyhole on the button and there you have it nice and flat and that's how we saw on a button on a bespoke jacket and how you sew the buttons on is very important so that it would last as long as the garment lasts. There's no excuses why a button should fall out.